are two approaches in the field of astronomy. First, a practical approach. The determination of the positions of stars is fundamental for the elaboration of the navigation tables and very incidentally for the zodiacal forecasts. The other approach is that of scholars who seek explanations for the motion of stars. The two approaches are not contradictory, but they have never been reconciled. The success of the theories always came from their ability to give results consistent with the measures. But, theories were maintained for centuries despite large discrepancies with observations. Most often, efforts are made to tinker with, or even ignore, contrary experiments. The development of geometry, then mathematics, was always at the origin of new theoretical approaches. The evolution of the mathematical tools gradually reverses past theories. Euclid's geometry is at the origin of the big Greek movement. Aristotle's system is essentially of geometrical order. The differential calculus is the basis of physics since Newton. The direct simulation of the phenomena by computers now gives a severe aging to the mathematical formulations. The system of Pythagoras is characterized by a harmony organized according to the numbers. The central fire is the center of the world. All the celestial bodies turn around the central fire. The sun is a transparent crystal which reflects the light of the central fire. This central fire is located on the side of the antipods, part and inhabitable. The earth thus always presented this face towards the central fire, as the moon always presents us the same face. The central fire is therefore invisible from the earth. To the then known celestial bodies, Pythagoras adds an anti-earth, located opposite the earth with regard to the central fire. The anti-earth is therefore also invisible. The idea of trajectory did not exist. The rotations of celestial bodies were not bound to plans, but to spheres. Every celestial body has its sphere. Spheres have relative dimensions harmoniously distributed in the scale of the numbers. This notion of a bearing sphere is linked to the idea of perfection of the sphere. The celestial bodies were naturally all spherical. This idea is fundamental. It is still present at Copernicus and Tycho Brahe. Only the perfection of the sphere could suit the celestial bodies both for their shape and for their motion. The system of Heraclites, contemporary of Pythagoras, is marked by a refusal of the immutable, of all forms of absolutes, of invariants, pentare, everything flows. We shall find at Plato this immense intuition that things perceived cannot reach either infinity or absolute. The infinite and the absolute belong exclusively to the mind. Evidence rejected by Aristotle. But all the systems based like the Aristotle system on the existence of absolutes collapse more or less rapidly. Yes, it is of Syracuse, one of the successors of Pythagoras, explain the general diurnal rotation of celestial bodies by the rotation of the earth upon itself. At the time of Plato and at the time of Aristotle, the Pythagoreans had for a long time put the central fire in the center of the earth, itself in rotation around its own axis, extraordinary intuition once more ruled out by Aristotle. The other enters physics with the Sicilian Empedocles. Previously, Heather was a Greek god reigning in the circular perfection of heaven. For Empedocles, the ether is but a pure form of air. It is the medium filling the sky animated with vortices. The celestial bodies would have formed by accretion. 
it may be thought that he had observed the solid particles which gather in the center of swirling water. The celestial bodies and the earth in particular were disks. In spite of these weaknesses, the Empedocles system attributed for the first time a role to ether, but only for gravitation. For his part, Plato takes back the four elements of Pythagoras the fire, the air, the water and the earth and adds the other. These elements are only qualities. The water which evaporates becomes an element air. The water which freezes becomes solid, it is an element earth. There are no absolute elements for Plato. There are not any absolute motions as well. The ether of Plato is nothing but pure air, as it were for Empedocles. This ether overhangs the air in some way and extends to the starry sky. The ether is thus animated by a circular motion bearing the stars. It is its only role. Plato places the spherical earth around the axis of the world. But it is not positioned on this axis. This axis itself is not located. There is no absolute position for Plato. In addition to the retrograde sidereal rotation of the stars around the axis of the world, Plato put the sun, the planets and the moon in direct rotation around the axis of the ecliptic. But that was not enough. The planets and the moon must have other axes. All these axes intersect at the center of the Earth. The center of the Earth therefore has a special role. This will be the starting point of Aristotle. The idea of a center naturally leads to the spheres, the famous orbs. The celestial bodies are carried by orbs. Plato's system consists of nine spherical orbs. The outer orb turns from east to west around the axis of the world. The sky has a second internal orb without stars, which turns in the opposite direction. The orbs rotate the lower orbs. But as the first two outer orbits turn in opposite directions, they do not entrain the rotating lower orbs. The lower orbs carry the five planets then known, the sun and the moon. These orbs rotate at increasing speed with their distance to the Earth around the proper axis more or less inclined on the axis of the ecliptic. The Sun exercises on Mercury and Venus an alternation of attractions and repulsions which keeps them in its proximity. Finally, it does not turn on itself. Heracles, a disciple of Plato, taught like the Pythagoreans, that the Earth revolves around the axis of the world with a uniform diurnal movement and that the stars are fixed on their sphere. The planets would thus have had only one additional motion on their homocentric spheres. In addition, he posed the extraordinary hypothesis of an additional motion of Venus and Mercury around the Sun to explain their variable brilliance. The variation of the apparent diameter of the Sun, demonstrated by the eclipses and then perfectly known, left a doubt about the problem of the distances of the stars. By placing the Earth in the ranks of the planets, Heracles opened the way to heliocentrism, which was followed only about 2,000 years later. Aristotle assumed that the sky and the celestial bodies are made of ether. The circular movement is in the nature of the ether. The ether thus has a role in the rotation of celestial bodies. It could also have for the first time a role for the light. Aristotle thought that each sense is linked to a medium. So hearing is linked to the air, touching to the earth smell to the fire and taste to the water. The fifth sense, the sight, should therefore correspond to the other. But the rectilinear movement of light is in contradiction with the circular motion of the other. 
Aristotle therefore concludes that light is a property common to all elements, ether, fire, air, water and earth, the diapanus. The great difference with Plato is that these five elements have their own and absolute existence. No passage from one to the other is possible. Moreover, each of these elements has its own absolute motion, circular for ether, upward for fire, downward for earth and rectilinear only for water and air. The earth is heavy in itself. Everything that is earth must fall absolutely and it falls everywhere on the spherical surface of the earth. So that the element earth falls towards the center of the earth, which is therefore the center of the world. The moon and the planets are made of ether since they rotate. The same goes for the sun. But Aristotle curiously attributed their heat to the speed of motion in the air. The motionless center of the earth is the center of the world and the 56 spherical orbs of Aristotle's system. The orb of stars, supreme orb, turns from east to west. Stars are set in their orb. The sky has a second orb, without celestial bodies, turning from west to east, as for Plato. The orbs participate in the motion of orbs that are external to them. The motion of the four orbs of each celestial body is cancelled by the contra-rotating orbs, called reversing orbs, intercalated between the celestial bodies. The orbits of the stars and the reversing orbs are of such thickness that there is no void. The celestial bodies are fixed to their fourth orb rotating at the contrasynodic velocity around an axis inclined at an acute angle to that of the third. The third orb turns at the synodic speed around an axis proper to each celestial body. This axis passes through the Sun for Mercury and Venus. The second rotates about a proper axis not very far from the axis of the ecliptic at the zodiacal velocity. The first orb turns around the axis of the world at the diurnal speed. Aristotle's system made it possible to build astrolabes for navigation. This Greek astrolabe was found in a ship dating from 87 before Christ. The moon has three orbs. All rotations are uniform. Aristotle knew that Mercury and Venus have a variable brightness. He also knew that the Sun and the Moon do not have a constant apparent diameter. This is proven by eclipses. The variation of distance observed by change of apparent diameter or brightness is impossible with the system of Aristotle. A century after Aristotle, Aristarchus took back the rotation of the Earth upon itself, affirmed by Heracles, and added the rotation of the Earth around the Sun. Aristotle's system of the world seemed rejected. Aristarchus was accused by the Greeks of sacrilegious profanation. He had moved the center of the world, the residence of Jupiter. He was not condemned to drink hemlock thanks to a prompt and complete retraction. A precursor of Lavoisier, Lucas asserted that nothing is ever created from nothing and that nothing returns to nothingness. In Lucas we find the uniform fall of atoms, the cause of gravity, and the vortices which are essential for the formation of aggregates by accretion, from the bodies which surround us to the celestial bodies. The constitutive elements of the universe are emptiness and matter. Matter is an aggregate of atoms a primary unity which does not exist in the isolated state. The matter moves in emptiness. Without emptiness, motion is impossible. The ether is made up of the smallest aggregates of atoms, and therefore it is the lightest. It moves towards the sky. The celestial bodies are driven by the circular vortex of the sky. 
its impetuosity decreases when going away from its seat. The speed of the planets thus decreases according to their position between the sky and the earth. This vortex is a swirling air. Luke resides to it an opposite current of air, a counter vortex. Moreover, a variable density of this air would explain the unequal duration of days and nights. Lucas's theory of colors is truly revolutionary. Color does not belong to the body, but to the light itself. This extraordinary discovery is justified by the changing color of the peacock feathers and of the surface of the sea. Three centuries after Aristotle, Ptolemy resumed the theory of circular movements by adapting it to account for the seemingly erratic movements of the planets. By the way, the Greek word planet means erratic. It was necessary to explain both the motion of the planets and the variations of their apparent diameter, which also affected the sun, as can be seen during eclipses. Ptolemy maintained the central and fixed position of the Earth, the circular trajectories and the constant velocities on each circle, only compatible with the perfection necessary for the creation. The center of the Earth is thus still the center of the world. However, the planets, the Sun and the Moon are carried by spheres carrying their trajectories. Their trajectories, the epicycles, are centered on sphere centered on the Earth, the deference. The real trajectories of the planets, the Sun and the Moon are no longer circles. But the center of the spheres carrying the deference is the center of the Earth. This system gave the illusion of respecting the dogmas enunciated by Aristotle. Things are even more complicated. Compliance with observations is only possible if the speed of the celestial bodies on their epicycle is variable. This variable speed would have no theoretical justification. For the velocity to be constant, and thus conforming to the postulate of Aristotle, Ptolemy added a circle. He invented the equid. It is a circle centered at twice the distance from the center of the world to the center of the deferent. The center of the deferent of the moon describes a circle centered on the center of the world. The deferent of Mercury is centered on a circle whose center is near the center of the world in the radius equal to half the distance from its center to the center of the world. Moreover, he added his famous tenth sphere made necessary by the precession of the equinoxes. The enormous advantage of the complex system of Ptolemy was to allow calculations and to make tables. They were used for navigation until modern times. The accuracy of the tables drawn from the system of Ptolemy, the famous tables of Marseille and London, remained unparalleled for centuries. It was not until 1444 that Nicholas B. Cuse commented with his hand on a work on astronomy which was found only in 1843. This text has never been published, but it gives an idea of the ideas which should prevail at the time. Nicholas B. Cuse rejected not only the geocentrism of Aristotle, but also every idea of center of the world. It was to return to Plato's position. The system of Nicholas E. Q's is very complicated. Each sphere has two movements around perpendicular axes. He attributed the diurnal rotation to the Earth and not to the sphere of the stars. He thus adopted the very old idea of Heracles Ponticus. We have just seen that the idea of the center of the world was not accepted without reticence. Copernicus did not question this foundation of Aristotle's system. But, for Copernicus the center of the world, it is the sun. What is Copernicus' justification? 
the Earth is round. It must have a motion compatible with its shape. Since, according to Aristotle, what is circular must have a circular motion, the Earth must also have a circular motion. The Earth having a motion, it cannot remain at the center of the world. So it is the Sun which is there. Maybe, but the Sun is also round. Why would it be motionless in the center of the world? Copernicus's argument falls. The first round is lost. For Aristotle, too. If the Earth is no longer the center of the world, why is it round? What is the cause of the gravity which Aristotle pretended to explain by the natural motions of the elements? The Earth falls. That would be his nature. For Copernicus, gravity is a natural appetite of the parties to be found in their unity. This unity is the sphere for all the celestial bodies. Maybe, but then all the elements must go back to that unit and the fire must fall back. Copernicus lost the second round. The axis of the orbits of planets are not the axis of the Earth rotation. They approach and move away from the apogee to the perigee relative to the Earth. Copernicus strengthens his argument against the central position of the Earth. He is about to win the third round. But he deduces from this that in the system of Aristotle the planets have a linear motion from front to back and the reverse according to the period, in addition to their circular motion. This is to forget that Ptolemy saved Aristotle from this incoherence. The planets describe circles carried along the main circles of their movement. They have no linear motion. Copernicus' argument falls. The round is null. The stars all have the same angular velocity. Their tangential velocity decreases from the equator to the poles. They are all on the celestial sphere, at the same distance from the center of the world, but describe smaller and smaller circles when approaching the poles. Copernicus saw an inconsistency in the system of Aristotle. The stars do not all have the same motion. Would tangential velocity be more the motion than angular velocity? Copernicus and Aristotle both lost the fourth round. Mercury and Venus pass between the Earth and the Sun and also beyond the Sun. These planets are never eclipsed by the Earth. The distance of these planets to the Earth can be explained only by placing the Earth in circular motion between the orbs of Venus and Mars. Aristotle gives up. Copernicus won the fifth round in the party. But there remains this unfortunate second round. One must wait for Galileo. A scholar as famous as Tycho Brahe will keep on with the system of Aristotle revised and corrected by Ptolemy. Copernicus claimed that his system required only 34 spherical orbs. In fact, Kepler showed that the famous triple movement given to the Earth by Copernicus did not allow him such a reduction in the number of orbs in relation to the Ptolemaic system. Copernicus should have added the necessary orbs necessary to compensate for the additional motions he gives to the Earth. The elimination of the Ptolemy equants ultimately brings no gain. In his first book, Kepler took sides for the Copernican system. He was only 24 years old. If he subsequently gave his preference to the system of Ptolemy, it was only on the mathematical level. An extraordinary combination of circumstances, and, still more, of errors which cancelled each other, was leading Kepler to the solution. He moved to Prague and replaced Tycho Brahe. He then plunged into the astronomical readings of his predecessor. As he attempted to establish the motion of the Earth, 
he discovered a six minutes variation in the positions of Mars. By chance, the eccentricity of Mars is greater than that of the Earth. The trajectory of Mars can in no way be circular. The trajectories are ovals, which Kepler will ultimately make elliptical. He then determined the laws of the motion of the planets, the famous law of the areas in particular. It is in his calculations that mathematicians have discovered, much later, errors that compensate each other. Another important progress, Kepler came to the conclusion that the cause of the motion of the planets is in the Sun. And for the Moon. The cause of its movement is at sea in the Earth. Kepler came to conceive a kind of vortex. The motion of sunspots shows that the sun turns on itself. A species matrix emanates from the sun, which communicates its rotation to it. This species matrix sweeps along the planets and rotation like a rapid vortex. By discovering the satellites of Jupiter and their rotation around this planet, Galileo definitively ruined the idea of a fixed center of the world. There are centers of the world everywhere, thus no center of the world. The problem of motion was approached by the fall of bodies. Galileo was the first to formulate the law of the fall of bodies, in complete contradiction with the theory of Aristotle. A stone ball falls as fast as a ball full of feathers of the same apparent surface. The famous experiment was carried out at the Tower of Pisa. The mass does not intervene. Nevertheless, neither did Galileo nor Copernicus make any comparison between the fall of bodies and the rotation of the planets and their satellites. The intuition of Descartes was that light and gravity are borne by the same medium. Kepler had compared the force of gravity to light, but it was only on the formal aspect of the diminution of their action with distance. It is something fully different with Descartes. Galileo had ended two foundations of Aristotle's theory. The elements would have absolute motions, and the Earth is the center of the world. For his part, Descartes put an end to the Diapanis, the theory of the light of Aristotle. There is no Diapanis common to the five essential elements, but propagation of a perturbation within a fluid medium filling the space. The other, a word Descartes did not use in order to stand out completely from the whims of Aristotle. Descartes thought that the corpuscles of his liquid matter left no void between them. Also, light was transmitted instantaneously. In 1676, Romer measured the celerity of light. As many scholars, including Huygens, noticed it, it was enough to renounce this kind of density of the liquid matter of space, which so became for light, what air is for sound. The motion of the planets reminded Descartes of the vortices of Kepler. The liquid matter of space was thus affected with multiple vortices. As seen in the gyrocyclones, the denser parts of the fluid gather in the center of the vortex. You can make sure of this in your cup of tea, turn the contents and let the movement continue. You will see the plots that the strainer has not stopped, gather in the center. This is an accretion effect. It was the idea of Empedocles. The system of Descartes is thus the first attributing the fall of bodies and the rotation of the celestial bodies to one and the same cause. This cause is the gyrocyclone effect. In the case of the celestial bodies, this effect opposes the centrifugal acceleration. It is the way Descartes explains the fact that the planets composed of heavy matter like terrestrial objects, can remain in equilibrium on their orbit. But it is impossible to explain with this system how gravity is vertical on the Earth. 
The rotation of these vortices was perpetuated by inertia, no action opposing them, and frictions being considered negligible. In the world of Descartes, the Michelson experiment would also have also given no results. It is impossible to see any change in the celerity of light due to the motion of the Earth if the Earth moves with the medium that carries the light itself. But there is something even more surprising. The world of Descartes explains the experiment of Sagnac. Everything happens as if the tangential velocity of the Sagnac disk was added to or subtracted from the celerity of light according to the direction of the path of the light. The experiment of Sagnac poses no difficulty in the world of Descartes. The disk of Sagnac rotates with regard to the liquid matter of Descartes, supporting both light and gravitation. It is no less surprising to find in the treatise on light, this curious sentence, about the rays of light passing near the sun, to which I could add that they must be somehow curved towards the sun. The theory of Descartes with its vortices also provides an explanation for the rotation of the celestial bodies on themselves and for the differential rotation of the surfaces of the gaseous planets in the sun, which remain unexplained. The system of Descartes had a severe defect. It could only be quantitatively linked to experiment in some particular cases. Thus, in spite of its extremely fascinating analogies, it has been abandoned in favor of exclusively mathematical theories. Newton postulates that the bodies attract themselves in proportion to their mass and in inverse proportion to the square of the distance which separates them. Everything was complying so perfectly to the observations that the Cartesians, who were unable to find this relation with their vortices, were soon forgotten. It is very surprising that Newton had accused Descartes of not having considered the action of the centrifugal acceleration when this was his great concern. This acceleration opposes, in the system of Descartes, to vortex accretion. Newton has attempted to find a physical model of gravitation. His first attempt consisted of a condensation of a fluid on the surface of bodies. But the effect of a fluid flow on a body is not proportional to its mass. Then he proposed another explanation at the end of his Treaty of Optics. Space would be filled with a more and more dense ether when going away from matter. This density would have been extremely low so that the motion of the celestial bodies would not have been affected. The gravitation would have been due to the variation of density, so that bodies are pushed towards the less dense parts of the other. However, the push of Archimedes results from gravity. It cannot therefore be the cause of gravity. His theory of light is a strange mixture of emissive theory, therefore granular, and of an ether filling space, but of variable density. This variable density allows it to explain, in particular, the refraction. The corpuscles of light, by encountering matter, would put in vibration the ether included in bodies. The light would not be undulatory, but would have undulatory effects. Newton justified his corpuscular approach by the rectilinear propagation of light. The theory of massage is a theory of gravitation. The attraction between two bodies would result from the screen effect of these bodies with regard to corpuscles that would fill space. If, at the outset, all the bodies were gathered in a compact mass and then divided and distributed in space, there would be a relative vacuum between them. It is only much later that the kinetic theory of gases brought an additional condition. The mean free path of the corpuscles must always be greater than the average distance between bodies. This cannot be envisaged for celestial bodies. 
Lesage has been led to a quite remarkable hypothesis for the action of its medium to be proportional to the mass of bodies, the corpuscles must act within matter itself. He assumed, therefore, that matter is made up of very small elements, points at the limit. Between these points, his corpuscles move freely. It is therefore that matter is practically empty what was discovered only about two centuries later. There has been much epilogue on the authorship of this theory of gravitation by mask effect. Facio di Duilier proposed a similar theory. In reality, Lesage's hypotheses far outweigh the others by their coherence, and presently one speaks only of the theory of Lesage. From the middle of the 18th century, an impressive series of discoveries polarized physics on the problems of electricity and magnetism. Von Kleist invented the capacitor in 1735 by accumulating the electric fluid obtained by friction. The device was named Bottle of Light. Did Newton's law govern all the forces of nature? This is the question that Kaolin solved with his famous balance. The electric force is proportional to the inverse of the square of the distances. Cavendish emitted the principle of negative electricity and positive electricity. Le Manier discovered in 1736 the electric currents. He had connected the collector of a bottle of light with its tin coating. He mistakenly imagined that he measured the speed of the electric matter on the basis of the duration of the discharge. The most amazing thing is that the speed of the electrons in the conductors has never been measured up to now. These discoveries enabled Volta to invent the electric cell in 1800. Salzer had discovered that the electric fluid stings the tongue. Volta discovered that the tongue, placed between two metal plates, perceives an acid or alkaline effect according to the order of the metals. He classified them according to their electrical effect. It was the way to his brilliant invention, the electric cell, made of a stack of zinc and copper plates, separated by moistened cardboard discs. One of the applications of this discovery led to the modern chemistry which we leave aside. Another application was the study of electric currents. In 1820, Oerst had confirmed the hypothesis of a link between electricity and magnetism. He observed that an electric current diverts a magnetized needle. Laplace enunciated the mathematical law of magnetic force. The laws of electric currents were established by Ampere and Ohm in 1827. Finally, to limit himself to the essential, Faraday discovered in 1830 the induction currents. It was necessary to pass by these essential discoveries to understand the world as today's science considers it. In the same way, some precisions are necessary in the field of light to understand how the scholars have been forced to accumulate the postulates of the current system. The interferences occur outside the presence of material bodies and is therefore a property of light in complete contradiction with Newton's theory. Newton's idea of a corpuscular light was forgotten. The light was carried by a medium, the other. All scholars agreed on this point. Hooke and Euler showed that the wavelets of ions were perfectly compatible with rectilinear propagation. The light consisted of waves in the ether as the sound in the air. A discovery was going to upset this beautiful edifice. In 1800, Malice discovered the polarization of light by reflection. Connected to the refractive polarization discovered by Huygens, this discovery was the beginning of huge difficulties. The fatal blow, at least it was believed, 
to the corpuscular theories that resurfaced here and there was given by Foucault in 1850. He showed that the light is slower in water than in the air. At the same time, Fizeau discovered that the Doppler effect, highlighted for sound in the air, also exists for the light. This phenomenon is often considered as a consequence of the undulatory nature of light. It is not entirely true. As you move towards waves, the apparent wavelength is reduced. The opposite happens if the waves move away. Waves are needed, of course, but the phenomenon results above all from a relative motion with respect to the waves, of relative velocities with respect to the waves. The consequence of the discovery of polarization was to attribute a transverse nature to luminous vibrations. But only solids can carry such waves. The other then became a solid filling space. Although Maxwell discovered absolutely nothing and did not perform no the slightest experiment, he gave the whole set of electromagnetic phenomena equations a coherent structure. Since then, all the fundamental equations bear his name, followed by that of their true inventor. Hertz, in 1887, produced electrically waves which propagated the speed of light. This was, of course, the triumph of Maxwell's system. The equations of Maxwell Ampere and Maxwell Hertz, however, are at the origin of the monstrous problems that arose thereafter. However, is the other motionless, partially dragged or totally dragged by matter? Hertz assumed a total dragging. However, Fizeau's experiments had shown that the ether was only partially dragged by flowing water thus causing an optical path difference. Lorentz attributed this optical path difference not to the dragging by matter, but to a very property of matter. Lorentz assumed that the ether is motionless and independent of the motions of matter which cannot drag it, although ether penetrates inside matter. The Lorentz system should lead to a decomposition of the spectral lines by magnetic fields. The experiments carried out by Zeeman confirmed this prediction of Lorentz, giving his theory of prodigious success. Unfortunately, a spirit of rare rigor set the cat among the pigeons. Poincaré noticed that the system of Lorentz, based on equations of Maxwell, did not conform to the principle of equality of action and reaction. Much worse, in 1881, Morley and Michelson, with their famous interferometer, failed to highlight the motion of the Earth and the motionless ether of Lorentz. The Earth revolves around the Sun at some 30 kilometers per second, speed perfectly accessible to the measure. This failure had an enormous echo. Lorentz did not consider himself defeated and undertook to modify his system. He assumed that the distances become shorter during a displacement with respect to the other and that the time lengthens. Lorentz calculated that by approaching the celerity of light, the length of bodies along their velocity decreases until nullifying. It is therefore that the celerity of light is an impassable limit. Lorentz attempted to use theory of massage to explain the gravitational attraction of two electrons and thus explain gravitation. He then tried to use Maxwell Bartholdi's wave pressure. He failed in both cases. Point there, however, had noticed a severe anomaly in Maxwell's equations. More precisely, the Maxwell-Hertz equation contains, in one of its terms, a vector dependent on speed. This vector, formerly known as the displacement current, is modified by composition of the speeds during the changes of Galilean coordinates that is in uniform rectilinear translation with respect to one another. 
the result would be actions that do not actually exist. Historically, the concept of relativity was a rather confused notion without any real scientific utility. It was a consequence of philosophy of Plato. There is no absolute in nature. The dimensions of all objects in the universe could be doubled or halved without anything being changed. After recalling this notion, Poincare established the principle of relativity. The laws of physical phenomena should be the same whether for an observer fixed and for an observer carried along in a uniform movement of translation, so that we have not and could not have any means of discerning whether or not we are carried along in such a motion. The maxwell hertzs equation does not conform to this principle of relativity. Einstein noticed that formulas of Lorentz solved this problem at the same time, and this was the critical point that made everything tip over, explaining the negative result of Michelson's experiment. It was also necessary that the celerity of light should be an absolute limit. Einstein sent his famous memoir to a journal of physics in 1905. One of the most famous consequences is the increase in body mass with speed. The inertia increases progressively so that the action of the acceleration tends to zero when the speed of the body tends towards the celerity of the light. This mathematical consequence of the theory of relativity led Einstein to his famous principle of equivalence mass energy, E equal mc squared. At the same time, the discovery of the quantified, and therefore corpuscular, nature of light shook physics. The other was then eliminated. Light can no longer be a vibration of a medium. It is a corpuscle bearing an associated wave. This is the theory of Louis de Broglie. The light is made up of corpuscles, the photons. These corpuscles have an associated wave that explains the undulatory properties of light. This wave is the vibration of an electromagnetic field. It is transverse. This explains the polarization, in particular, property that does not exist in the waves of continuous media. The corpuscular properties of light, like the photoelectric effect, result from the corpuscular and quantified nature of the photon. Since the energy of a free-falling body would increase without its mass changing, Einstein deduced that the celerity of light had to be modified by the fields of gravitation. This was the basis of the reflections which lead him towards the general relativity. The general relativity consists in extending the basic idea of special relativity to the case of accelerated reference frames. General relativity is directly traced on special relativity. The laws of nature are the same for observers who find themselves in relation to each other in any state of motion and therefore also for accelerated relative motions. Gravitation is only acceleration. The idea of material support of gravitation is thus completely eliminated as was the idea of ether for light. The consequences of the special relativity theory have been verified in a very large variety of circumstances. There are some old things, hidden in the cupboards. The experiment of Sagnac remains the subject of controversy, sometimes very vivid, between physicists. This is the principle of the gyro losers installed in all aircraft. The special relativity theory is an approximation of the general relativity theory when the fields are very weak. The special relativity theory is used to explain the Michelson experiment. The Earth revolves around the Sun at a speed of about 1 to 24th of a degree per hour. The special relativity theory should therefore be able to explain the Sagnac experiment for very low rotational speeds. Gyro can detect speeds lower than one hundredth of a degree per hour. 
Now, Professor Saleri has demonstrated that the special relativity theory cannot explain the Sagnik experiment. The experiment of Morley and Michelson did not give a completely negative result. Dayton Miller measured speeds of 9 km per second, which is far from negligible compared to the expected 30 km per second. Professor Lay demonstrated that the values obtained are connected to frequencies of astronomical phenomena, essentially, to the position of the Earth and the Moon. There can therefore be no question of a temperature effect or of measurement errors. Then there are the internal inconsistencies in the current system. The most serious is the opposition between the deterministic nature of relativity and the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics. The theory of strings was supposed to reconcile these two positions. Unfortunately, it gave no result and is now completely abandoned. There are also false problems. There is primarily the problem of the missing mass of galaxies. The motion of stars in galaxies is not complying with to Newton's law. 90% of the mass of galaxies is missing. We look for the missing mass for 80 years. But now, it all goes wrong. The constant rotation speed of the galaxies is proportional to their visible mass. The missing mass, or dark mass, must therefore be proportional to the visible mass. Such proportionality can only be explained if there is a link between the two masses and therefore a localization of the missing mass that does not allow us to find Newton's law. I will insist neither on the untraceable dark energy, nor on the mysterious disappearance of the antimatter. These are consequences of the cosmological vision of general relativity, the Big Bang. The beginning of the 21st century saw the difficulties continuing. The high-tech mechanical gyroscopes of the Gravity Probe B experiment were supposed to show the gravitational dragging planned by the general relativity theory. The results were largely manipulated to obtain a result that seems qualitatively to meet expectations. Unfortunately, they reveal unexpected astronomical influences, particularly connected to the position of the Earth and the Moon as in the Morley and Michelson experiment. All hope is not lost. All these difficulties are paradoxes. Moreover, there are many other paradoxes in quantum mechanics. That's very fine. According to Hegel, the quantitative accumulation of paradoxes must lead to the qualitative leap the great leap forward towards the total understanding of the universe. The leaps forward, however, raise a problem. If you are in front of a precipice, this may not be the best idea. It is certainly impossible to question the causal sequence of theories since Newton. Problems never come from a lack of logic. But logic is a problem. It rests on premises, on postulates. The basic postulates are always the only cause of the fall of the systems of the world. And these postulates are most often so deeply anchored in the minds that they seem perfectly indisputable. 